morning. It is good to be with you, even though it is virtually this morning. It's good to have you here joining in with us online. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for worshiping with us. And we do want to encourage you to do that, even in the comforts of your own home or wherever you may be, traveling or whatever. Lean in and worship. It's, it's a great time for us to come together as the body of Christ and celebrate our King and sing His praises. And we just want to invite you to do that with us this morning. Uh, as always, you can uh, do your giving online you, or you, when you come back next week, because next week we are planning on kicking things back off. We should be back in the sanctuary next Sunday. We encourage you all to be here with us next Sunday as we do that. And we'll be beginning all of our regular activities this week and more on that at the end of the service when we give our announcements. But uh, in way of giving, you can give online now or uh, if you want to wait till you return next Sunday and bring them here to the church, uh, that, that'll be fine too. But we do encourage you to, to do that because the needs of the church continue, the needs of our missionaries in the field, they, they continue. And uh, this is how we get to sow into this ministry of making the gospel known to the nation. It's more about, more than just about this building, more about keeping the lights on here. It's about spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we have a wonderful opportunity to do that. And we thank you for your, for your faithfulness in, in, your, in your tithes and your offerings to this local assembly. Um, even though we may be separated physically, uh, we are united under the bonds of Christ, under the majesty of Christ. And this morning we have a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to celebrate him together. And uh, as we sing these next few songs, and as Pastor Ian comes up in just a few minutes and he opens the Word of God, and we and we continue to study from this amazing book, I, I pray that we would just open our hearts and our minds, and we would just 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 focus in on our on our on our God and His greatness. We would allow him to speak to us, to mold us, to change us, to teach us from the power of his word. And as we sing these next few songs before, before Pastor Ian comes, we have the opportunity to lift our voices in his praises. And he is worthy. So just as we encourage you when you're in this room, we want to encourage you this morning, wherever you are, to sing it out. Stand up, lift your hands, whatever it is you would normally do in this place, do it right where you are. Because it's the same God, no matter where we are. He is worthy of our same worship, no matter where we are. So let's just sing to him today. Let's just honor him today, worship him today with everything we are, everything we have, because he is worthy. Would you pray with me? Father, we are humbled and amazed in your presence. God, that you would love us the way that you do. That you would look down on sinful men and women like us and love us enough that even while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us that we may be redeemed to you and have an eternal home with you in your very presence. What a blessing that is, oh God. And, and Lord, we just... We just want to say thank you. We just want to say we love you. And we just want to worship you today. So God, as we are gathered in your presence, even, even if gathered <laughs> separately, I know using the word gathered is, is, is awkward in the fact that we're not in the same room. But Lord, uh, we are all zoned in to one place to your presence before your throne. And so, Lord, as we gather there, I just pray you would help us to lift high the name of Jesus. For he alone is worthy of our praise. And in him alone is salvation found, is redemption found, is hope found. So, God, help us to honor you as we proclaim the goodness of your Son. And Lord, have your way, move in a mighty way in our hearts and our lives, wherever we are. And God, as we go about our week this week, 
Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities to share the love of Jesus with those around us because this world so desperately needs you. And this has never been more evident than in the days in which we live today. So God, fill us with excitement, fill us with energy, fill us with boldness, fill us with wisdom of words we should say. And help us to be faithful to the message that Jesus and Jesus alone is Savior. He is the only hope for mankind. Bring great glory to yourself today. And we'll thank you for everything you do. We love you, Lord. We ask your blessings on us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I need you to soften my heart, break me apart. I need you to open my eyes, to see that you're shaping my life. Oh my God.
worship this morning. Um, we're going to be singing about our God and how powerful and wonderful and beautiful His name is. I know throughout my days and throughout my week, I find myself all the time just saying out loud, God, I need you right now. I can't do this. And especially when we're um, facing things that we're facing right now, we're at a moment's notice. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, goodness, I get to stay home for two weeks because someone around me was sick and I don't want to make others sick. You discover your limitations and how much we need others around us and how much we need our Savior. And like Zane was saying earlier in the welcome, you know, we're all gathered separately, but we're gathered praising the same God. And I know around the world, there are people singing out and crying out His name in so many different languages. So I just want to encourage you this morning, while you're probably all snuggled up on your porch, drinking your coffee, listening to the rain in your sweatshirt, I want to encourage you that you aren't alone and that we all need the same Savior.
recover from the coronavirus. It, it, it was touch and go there for about 12 seconds. Uh, we were uh, just a very, very strange way. I got exposed somehow. I don't know how. Carrie was exposed. So we both tested positive. And uh, the worst thing that I've experienced, I'm not completely over, but I lost all my sense of smell and taste, which is both advantageous and very uh, disadvantageous. So uh, eating was very lackluster. Uh, Carrie would ask, what, what would you like for dinner? And I said, it really does not matter. You can, uh, I mean, Chunky Alpo is something I requested one night. I mean, what difference does it make? I thought about having, putting water on my cereal. It, it just didn't matter. So it seems like this morning, my coffee just is bad. The past two weeks, it's been absolutely horrible. And having, you know, for me to be able to have to choke down coffee, there's something wrong in the universe. When I have to choke down coffee, I actually limited myself. I'm glad that you're sitting down. Limited myself to two cups. And not two, like, 60-ounce cups like I normally have, but two, two little cups. So that seems to be coming back to normal. I can uh, taste many things now. You know what I didn't taste this morning? Donuts. I didn't taste any donuts. Yeah, I, I do appreciate everybody who has called or texted or messaged me uh, asking how we we're doing. I appreciate that very much. Uh, and we are all up and running in the middle of a bathroom remodeling project. And you never know how painful that is when you can't go to the hardware store or the lumber yard by yourself. You got to call somebody and ask. So I appreciate Mark. He's gone, done a number of errands for me, and Misty, and Seth, and all those folks who brought us uh, Lysol wipes, and uh, just, just taking care of us. We appreciate it very much, and I'm sure Mark uh, will be back, uh, back next week. I hope so, because he's preaching. Isn't he preaching? Mark, who's preaching next week? Zane's preaching. Zane will probably come up lame at some point. All right, so the last time we were in Genesis, I know everybody was wondering, and it just worked out well. I was supposed to preach uh, two weeks ago, and uh, Chris preached for us, and then last week Zane filled in, so appreciate everybody's flexibility. But we are back in Genesis, and our time in Genesis is drawing to a close. The last time we were in Genesis, we saw God give Israel instruction to go to Egypt, where he would become a great nation. Israel's direct descendants numbered 66, not including wives. They packed up their stuff and they made the journey to Egypt. Joseph met Israel in Goshen and there was a very tearful reunion between father and son. Israel concluded he could now die because he had seen Joseph with his own eyes. Joseph spoke to Israel told him what to say to Pharaoh to ensure that his family could work as shepherds in Goshen. This morning we'll see the business aspect of Joseph's mind as he ensures his family is taken care of and also expands Egypt at the same time. So if you have your Bibles on your lap, turn to Genesis chapter 47 and we'll look at the first 26 verses. As Becky said, I'm sure on a morning like this, it's a dream come true. You can stay at home in bed and watch TV and see the message that we share with you this morning. You know, if you got to get up and go to the bathroom, you don't have to kind of look around sheepishly. You go and you get your snacks and you get your extra cup of coffee and you get a blanket or a hoodie. And it is just dandy. And all those people that are here in the sanctuary with us, they're all dressed the same way you are at home. Except me and, and Becky, and you saw Zane. But the rest of the crowd, you saw Mark too. Uh, so the crowd here is very, very small. The Owens family looks very good. They're, they're all dressed appropriately. And, uh, and, you know, we do see you at home. So Carrie's the only one not dressed up? Carrie is dressed up. Everybody is all dressed in the whole place. It's fine. That's the point. And nobody can, sleep, can see Zane slip out because he's already told me I'm doing the announcements. I don't know what that means. All 
All right, Genesis chapter 47. 47, beginning in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and pre presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many years have you lived? Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of the Ramesses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. Now there was no food in all of the land because the famine was very severe. So that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence? For our money is gone. Then Joseph said, Give up your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent and the cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field, because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you may sow the land. At the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. This morning we're going to look at Joseph's business plan. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful as 
Pastor Zane and Becky have said, we are gathered far away from each other, but Father, we are one in spirit, one in the body of Christ, and even though geography may separate us, nothing can separate us from one another, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, help us to understand this passage of scripture that seems so very familiar, yet so very strange. Lord, I pray that you would get glory from the preached word of God. And Lord, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is exciting. The brothers get an audience with Pharaoh. Remember that Joseph is second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. This has been a long time coming, this reunion, and the family's finally together. And it looks like they have put the past behind them. I tell you, it can be very difficult to put the past behind you, especially when you get constant reminders of what happened last week or last month or last year. And Facebook helps us by giving us our memories from a year or two years or 10 years ago. Joseph knows Pharaoh, and he knows what the conversation will go like so he prepares the brothers, he prepares his family on how to answer them. He selects five brothers to go in and meet with Pharaoh. Now remember, Joseph had 11 brothers. And there's some speculation on, only, on why only five went in. Some think that it was one brother for each year of famine that remained. Some think that that the, he didn't want to overwhelm Pharaoh. I mean, have you ever gone to, can you imagine going to the Duggars for the first time for Thanksgiving? And 300 people come out. He didn't want to be overwhelmed. Some people think that. So the brothers go in, meet with Pharaoh, and the question of occupation comes up. And we see this today all the time. You meet someone for the first time, and it, it almost immediately it's, hey, what do you do for a living? What do you do to earn money? It should be taken for granted that people do something to earn a living. There must be something that's done to support themselves so that people aren't a burden on society. Now, this is not popular this day. But the people in Egypt, Joseph did, want, did not want anyone to be a burden in Egypt. There's no place in Egypt for people to be idle. If they're not willing to work, then Joseph reasons they shouldn't eat. Now, those that don't need to work ought to have something that keeps them occupied. I'm amazed at the people who it seems that their primary occupation is being a Facebook warrior, being a keyboard warrior. They do all their work from behind the keyboard, and I wonder how do they have time to sleep when they're always on Facebook. I can post something and, you know, you get a, a like 12 seconds later. And sharing with the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul reminded them of his own example of hard work. Timothy and Silvanus were with him, and he said they never ate bread without paying for it. They didn't expect a handout. They worked night and day, so they were not a burden to that church. Paul concluded by telling them, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Today is different though, right? Somehow it's un-American to expect people to earn their own way. We have people demanding more money for the work that they do. If you can't make it on your own with one job, my friends, get a second job. Do something to change the situation. Learn a trade. Get a third job. Get a better job. I was downtown the other day, and you know if you live in St. Mary's, I know there are people probably watching from all over the world, but if you live here locally, You've seen the shrimp project downtown. There was shrimp phase one, and there's shrimp phase two that they're currently on. I took an opportunity during shrimp phase one, right before the, they're doing the ribbon cutting ceremony, and I helped lay block in the street. 
Why? Because they're going so darn slow that they weren't going to finish. So I just, I laid about 50 square feet of block down there. I, I, I know where it is. So on Friday, I was down there, and they were painting the crosswalk. And as a citizen of St. Mary's, I feel it my personal responsibility to make sure they do the job right. So Charlie Hester Construction is in charge of the Shrimp 2 project. And uh, Charlie's son was doing the crosswalk, and I didn't, I didn't recognize one of the guys there. And uh, Charlie said, Ian, that guy, he is a high school student. I thought, is he on some kind of work release, some kind of program? He said there's, they have a program at the high school where he was an intern with a construction company. And he knows how to lay brick, and he knows how to paint, and he knows how to do road work and construction. I thought, man, that's what we need in our society today is young people learning to work with their hands. I mean, Amelia and Zach, my daughter and son-in-law, just bought a house, and a new air conditioning system was put in. And Zane looked at it, and I looked at it, and the duct work is pathetic in that place. We need people willing to learn trades. So if you're unhappy in your current occupation, go to trade school, man. Get a vocation. Join the Navy. One of the, I remember growing up, the Army commercial. We don't need experience. We will give it. The Navy's motto was, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. There was something, and Mark, I don't, I don't know, when I was a recruiter, there's something like 118 different skills that you could learn, different job specialties in the Navy. Uh, Mark has learned how to be a fire controlman, knows computers, knows uh, all kinds of things about electronics, and the Navy taught him. You can learn a skill, and if you're less than 35, go see your local recruiter and do a turn in the U.S. military. They'll give you a skill that is marketable on the outside. Zach, my son-in-law, just finished the apprenticeship program on base. He's a machinist. He knows stuff. He knows how to use his hands. I mean, this is important things that we seem to be lacking in our society today. It's important to know a skill. If you can't make ends meet, get a second job. I knew a girl that worked three part-time jobs, or she had one full-time job, two part-time jobs, in order to make ends meet. She didn't expect anyone to help her make her way. A single mom. All too often, though, we don't like the answer to the problem. I don't want to find a better job because I might have to move away from my grown kids. And, you know, I've got grown kids, and both of my kids live here locally, and I don't take that for granted. But when I became of age, I moved away. When Carrie graduated from college, she married me, and we moved away. It's the normal part of life. Unless you want to live off the grid in Alaska or Montana or in some remote area, your kids will leave you and move on. We have FaceTime. Well, I don't, but we have, I've got Facebook Messenger. I can talk to my granddaughter in St. Augustine on video. It's not like that when I was a grand, when I was, say, I was always a grandkid, I guess. Uh, I didn't, to see my grandparents, I had to go visit them in Chicago. We couldn't just pick up a video chat. That was space age stuff. And now we're living in the space age. We've got all kind of methods that we can stay connected. So if there's a better job in Alabama and you can support yourself, then maybe you need to move. Parents should raise their children to be self-sufficient, productive members of society, and contribute to the overall well-being of the community. It applies to everyone, but particularly followers of Christ. Joseph wants Pharaoh to know that his family is going to work and not be a burden. They'd only be in Egypt for a while. They were going to sojourn. They're not going to permanently stay there. They were seeking the Egyptian dream to be able to sustain their lives because of the famine in their homeland. They asked if they could stay in Goshen to allow their flocks to eat in the pasture land. Pharaoh's response was predicted by Joseph and was dead on, but Pharaoh added a bonus. Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. 
Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if anyone is capable among them, put them in charge of my livestock. So not only were they able to live in Goshen, Pharaoh was going to give them a job as well. Couldn't have turned out any better. Now I want you to know it's important. The reason that this all happened is important. Pharaoh's kindness was because of Joseph. Pharaoh had great fondness for Joseph. And the family gained favor in Egypt because of Joseph. He was well respected in Egypt. He was well respected in Pharaoh's court. And because of this, his family is treated well. Sometimes we can be treated well because of whose child we are, whose brother or sister we are. Sometimes we can be treated well because of who we're married to. You hear people name drop a lot in order to gain favor. But the other can also be true. I was the youngest of seven and the youngest of five brothers, and we all went to the same school. So I was connected with my brothers in a somewhat unfavorable light. So because my brothers were like this, clearly I had to be like this. So maybe you have experienced that as well. Or maybe your sibling was smart, 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 and you're not as smart. And they say things like, why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? And in your mind, you're thinking, because I'm me. I'm me. I'm not like them. So it's time to introduce Jacob to Pharaoh. Have you ever introduced your parents to your boss? So Jacob presents Jacob to Pharaoh. Now presented here means a formal audience. So Pharaoh's likely wearing his, his, his robes, his royal robes, and looks all kingly. And the first thing Jacob does is bless Pharaoh. And we do the same thing. We meet our kid's boss and we'll say things like, I sure appreciate you giving them the opportunity to work here. Or they sure enjoy working here. I'm so grateful that you gave my son a job. In a strange bit of conversation, Pharaoh asked Jacob, how many years have you lived? Jacob, I think he's a, a bit dramatic. And he says, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. They haven't attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. He's 130 years old, and he's lamenting about the brevity of his life. What life he has had has been pretty rotten. His father Isaac lived to be 180 Grandfather Abraham lived to be 175, and here he is, 130. Now, remember, that society back in the day, they valued older people. In Hebrew culture, the assumption was the older you lived, the more favor you had with God. Leviticus 19.32 tells us to honor the aged. Zechariah 8.4 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women will sit, will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of his age. Genesis 25.8 says, Abraham lived to a ripe old age. Genesis 35.29 says, Isaac lived to a ripe old age. Jacob felt like he hadn't lived as long or as well as his ancestors. His days were few and unpleasant. And Carrie and I often have joked as uh, in ministry, you know, people have a bad day or a bad week. You know, there was time in our ministry where we had, you know, like a bad decade. But you just keep going. You know, Zane, have you had, you know, we had a bad, we had a bad year. You know, you have bad times. 
Israel's saying his whole life has been bad. Now, Zan, I know you've done marriage counseling. And, and it's always been, man, uh, you know, this is just hard to stay married. My whole marriage, all 30 years has just been awful. Really? All 30 years, not one single day has been bad, uh, has been good. Not one day. You just got to look. So Israel is saying, man, my life has been awful. Unpleasant means evil here. He doesn't give us the specifics. I, I, you know, he doesn't give us a laundry list of why his life is so evil, but he concludes his life of sojourning was not as pleasant as the years of Abraham or Isaac. And if you remember Abraham, right, he had this, this wonderful life where he was told to sacrifice his only son. What a great opportunity for Abraham, the wonderful life he lived. If you remember Abraham's first son, what was his first son's name? Ishmael. Yeah, what wonderful life this Abraham had. Isaac, he had a, a, a perfect life as, as well. You know, as a young, young man, he goes off to his dad in the wilderness, and he's going to get killed. Oh, great, great lives these people have. I think Israel was just a little bit too focused on himself. So after the conversation, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Now the meeting with Pharaoh is over. And Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, Ramesses as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. Joseph gets everything together, takes his family to the best area of Egypt. The land was provided by Pharaoh to honor Joseph. Joseph gave his family the supplies they needed to live in the land, sets them up, provided for everyone in the family, including the little ones, the children. If you remember Judah, this provision was particularly important to Judah. If you recall back in Genesis 43, 8, Judah urged Jacob to allow him to bring Benjamin back to the ruler of Egypt that we may live and not die, we as well as you and our little ones. Judah was particularly concerned for the security of his kids and also of the children of his brothers. But the famine continues on, so Joseph enacts the next phase of his plan. Look at verse 13. Now there was no food in the land, and all the land, because of the famine, was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Now, the famine, it's not just a shortage of some items like we saw during, or I guess that we still see during the pandemic, uh, hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes. And two weeks ago or last week, Zane, you mentioned toilet paper. Didn't you mention toilet paper last week? Had something to do with sovereignty. I don't remember. Uh, I remember toilet paper at some point. Zane was very concerned about a lack of toilet paper. I mean, he was starting to grow trees just so that he could get ahead of the curve. So we have, we have these shortages that seem, don't, they don't seem to make sense to us. So what, what Joseph and Egypt is dealing with isn't just a shortage of a few items. Like you get a, some new flavor of Coke. Now they've, they've got all kind of flavors of Coke and it's so popular that there's a shortage. That's not like this. There is no food in Canaan or Egypt. None. All the cupboards are bare. The, the shelves are empty. And the people languished because of the very severe famine. famine. Languished here means faint, starve, or waste away. The people were suffering because they were hungry. You know who had food? Pharaoh had food because of Joseph's plan. The food was collected as a tax over a period of seven years. 
When the people themselves ran out of food, they went to the government to purchase food. Stockpiling resources is something that is still done today with very good reason. Did you know the United States has stockpiles of crude oil, helium, heating oil, wheat, rice, corn, sorghum, antibiotics, vaccines, and a variety of emergency medical supplies. There's a lot of other stockpiles we have. And the United States maintains that. There's a whole branch of the government that maintains the United States stockpile. You probably have stockpiles of your own. I've got enough half-inch PVC couplings to choke a horse. I mean, if you need a half-inch CPVC coupling or elbow or a union, don't go to the store. Come, t come talk to me. I will make you a deal because I have recently shifted to PEX. So I've got really no need for all that CPVC. But you've got stockpiles of your own. Normally, I have a pretty good stockpile of coffee. Normally, we have a pretty good stockpile of milk that's in the freezer. We have bread in the freezer. We have our own stockpile so that you don't run out. Now, sometimes you stockpile for the wrong reasons, like stockpiling toilet paper. It's okay to have 10 or 15 rolls on hand, but you don't need 10 or 1,500 rolls or 2,000 rolls of paper towel. Now, ammunition, there's no limit on how, many, how much ammunition you should stockpile. You should have enough to last a certain length of time in a skirmish involving other people. Whoever the, the skirmish might be. So if you're looking, if you're wondering what, and I'm, I can't speak for Pastor Mark, but I can speak for Pastor Zane, Pastor Ian. If you're looking for what to get us for maybe uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, <laughs> Christmas, ammunition is always, always an appropriate gift for your pastor. <laughs> it's, it's always good. And, and if you're not sure where to get the ammunition, just gift cards with cash on them. We'll buy our own ammunition. There are people out there I know hollering amen. America, America right. <laughs> Mike McDermott, that's right, brother. I know, you're, you're jumping up. You're probably yelling at the TV saying, yes, yes, now there's some good preaching. The people in the region flocked to Egypt to get the resources they needed to live. Now you, I mean, the parallel to the United States is huge. Now I'm not saying uh, Egypt and the United States are different, but people come to the United States because of what the United States can offer. I heard the president say uh, yesterday that the United States Constitution has done more for the welfare and good of people than any other document, I will add, beside the Bible, has done more for the liberty and pursuit of things that are wonderful than any other document. People come to, the, to America because of the way our society is, because of the systems we have in place, for the protections afforded by the laws of our land. That's why people are flocking to come to the United States and not flocking to go to Libya or Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq. They want what we have in America, and Americans need to understand the privilege and also responsibility of living in this nation. We've got the resources to be able to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. What are we doing as a nation? The people still had money. So they were able to buy grain. But the money ran out. Verse 15 says, When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence? For our money is gone. Now, we're somewhat familiar with this in the church. Someone gets to the point that their money has run out. In desperation, they go to the church for help. Now, what I have experienced is that people that do not follow the Lord think the church is the answer for their financial and physical needs. I don't know where 
people out in town, out in the world, got the idea that the church is there to provide for your physical well-being. Now, I'm not talking about people in our church. I'm not talking about people who are members here or regularly attend here. I believe we have a responsibility to help and be benevolent in our actions. But I'm telling you, if money was the answer, we would give it. But money's not the answer. People have reached a point in Egypt and Canaan that all the money is gone and they go to Joseph seeking food so they won't die. And what happens in the next few verses is very overwhelming to me. Look at verse 16. Then Joseph said, give up your livestock and I'll give you, your, I'll give you food for your livestock since your money's gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all the livestock that year. The money's gone, but they still have assets. Now, I've used this strategy in my own life. I've used this strategy with other people. They are seemingly destitute. People come and are seemingly destitute. What can you sell in order to provide for your physical needs? If you're not willing to part with your earthly treasure, then there are other problems. Right after I retired from the Navy in 2006, which is, oh my goodness, over 14 years ago, I retired. Wow! Well, I didn't, I didn't retire. I just retired from the Navy. We had a plan. I was working as a contractor. I was doing odd jobs. I was doing handyman stuff, doing remodeling things, working with my hands in order to support my family. Uh, as I, I continued, we're looking for a job in ministry. We're sending out resumes. We're talking to people. But I'm still working. And as the money was, you know, we were trying to, to wrangle the money, the days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months, and I still had no job in ministry. So we had talked about what can we eliminate in our monthly budget to, to help us continue to pursue the call of ministry. We even talked about selling our house. We'll sell our house. Now, Becky was in elementary school, or she could have sold our house for us. Call Becky. We were going to even sell our house because we knew we could sell it. We could move to someplace else in the nation, and we could buy another house. And that would be one, you know, one, uh, one expense out of the way. We talked about getting rid of certain uh, what we consider luxuries. We don't need that. You know, we can sell this. We can sell that. We had a mental list of everything that we're willing to give up in order for us to continue to pursue God's call. What are you willing to do to make it? I mean, we've dealt with people with financial issues. Like, hey, have you thought about maybe selling that 2020 vehicle for a, a, maybe an older vehicle? Oh, well, no, it's only, you know, it's only $800 a month. And, and I, I think, you know, my first house payment I remember my first car payment was $69 a month, and I didn't know how in the world I was going to do that. I was, a, I think, a 22-year-old E-4 in the Navy. How in the world? My, my future mother-in-law co-signed the loan, and I think the loan was $2,600 for my, my new car. It was a Chevette, a four-door hatchback. I always kept the back seat down. I, I felt like I had a small Suburban. I thought I was like one of the original with the SUV, with my Chevette. I could reach across and roll down the window without even leaning over. I financed, Zane, I financed four tires. The four tires were $25 each, and the guy let me pay like $10 or $20 a month until they were paid off. $100 for tires. Now, I think, Mark, on your truck, probably one tire is probably twice that. Big, giant tires. Mark likes big trucks, which was very helpful getting my lumber. Thank you. What can you sell in order to live? 
What are you willing to do? If you're not willing to sell anything, and there's another example. We had uh, some folks in our church that were falling on hard times, and we did a yard sale together. We donated items for a yard sale, and we we're going to have this yard sale and give the money to them to help them. And they had one of them fancy schmancy. You remember those uh, space age washer and dryers? They're the front loaders. They sat up on the thing. They had the drawers underneath. They're like a thousand bucks a piece. And Carrie's pulling stuff literally that I am using. Like, we can sell that. I'm like, I'm using that. We can sell that. What? But no, we, we, that's a family heirloom. We can't sell that. So we're actually selling stuff that we still use. And you look at that washer and dryer and say, you know, you might want to consider selling that because you can get a brand new set, you know, for, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars. And your set's like $2,500. She said, oh, no, that's my, those are my dream. That's my dream washer and dryer. As a side note, if you fantasize about the washer and dryer that is going to meet all your dreams, something is wrong. I think a washer and dryer, I'll wash the clothes and dry them. I think that's good. But darn, you can't even, like they don't keep food cold. You can't drive it. You can't sleep in it. It's a washer and dryer. You don't need to spend all that money. The people are in a desperate place, and Joseph was in a position to trade with them. He traded them grain for the horses and flocks and herds and donkeys. He fed all those animals with food in exchange. He said, hey, give me your livestock. I'll take care of them. I'll feed them. That trade provided food for a year, and then the food ran out. Once again, the people go to Joseph, the one that has provided for them during this famine. Look at verse 18. When that year ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, we and our land? Buy us. Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. The money's gone. The animals have been traded. The people have just two things remaining, themselves and their land. The final phase of this business plan includes selling the people's seed so they could work the land in hopes of gaining a harvest in the future. Verse 20, so Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they didn't sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you may sow in the land. The people are given seed to plant and can work the land. Still one more facet to Joseph's plan. Verse 24 says, At the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh. Four fifths will be your own. For seed, for the field, for food, and for those of your household. And it's food for your little ones. So in order to preserve Pharaoh's economy and provide for the good of the people, Joseph enacts a 20% Tax and the people rejoice. They said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. The people are taxed and they cry out to Joseph in thanksgiving. For the record, don't raise. 
raise my taxes. I already pay plenty in taxes. I will not rejoice at the government raising my taxes or the city raising my taxes. I pay my fair share. I also pay like three or four other people's fair share because they're not working and supporting the, the, the economy. These people were excited to pay 20%. Now remember, they already owed Joseph their lives. They have nothing. They have no land, no horses, no donkeys, no, no animals. They don't have anything, no money. They have no assets. They don't even own their own lives, and they're excited about it. I don't understand that. Now, I, I truthfully, I have never been in an extreme famine. Now, I've been extremely hungry, but all you got to do is get up and you go to the, you go to the kitchen. I mean, even when we were young, there's always food. They didn't even have ramen back in when Carrie and I got married. You think of all the money we could have if we had ramen back then. I mean, pizzas were, I think, I think three or four dollars to order pizza, which we didn't really do that often when we were first married. Things are different now. Everything's so expensive. Our final verse says, Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. This was not a land grab to expand Joseph's personal wealth. This was done in the name of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's wealth increased. Now, valid to this day refers to at the time of the writing of that passage. If you think Joseph is rubbing his hands together in excitement at what is to come, I think you'll be wrong. I think Joseph's character has been proven time and time again. God revealed to him what was to happen, and Joseph came up with a plan based on his wisdom of knowing God. He worked the plan, and the people loved him for it. The man who was a slave has become ruler over people that willingly sold themselves so as not to die. So what about Joseph's father and his brothers? You will have to come back next week in person to find out the answer on what happens next. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful. Lord, we're grateful for the principles that we can learn in this passage of Scripture. Lord, we can also see how desperate people can become when they're hungry. So Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom as a church, as a church who you faithfully provide for to meet all of our financial needs. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom. Help us to know when to help. Help us to know when to say no. Lord, I pray that we would be good stewards of all that you have provided us, not just in financial resources, but in our facilities, in our people, in the talents that you have given people, in the spiritual gifting you have provided to each one of your followers. Lord, I pray as pastors we would shepherd the congregation well and lead us into a place that would glorify you, that would reach the community for Christ, and that we would be able to share the hope with a community that desperately needs to hear who you are, to see true followers of Christ living out their faith each and every day. Father, I commit our actions, I commit our goals. Lord, I commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
just a few announcements. Just trying to find the announcements. Uh, trying to look at the schedule. Let me let me go back here. Uh, no student ministries tonight. They will resume. Today's the twentieth, right? September twentieth. Who I think Zane, you told me on Friday. 1980 was 40 years ago. 19, I just, that struck me. 1980 is 40 years ago. Uh, here we are, September 20th, and I know you're thinking, man, fall has arrived. It, it hasn't, because this is, what, uh, this is what happens every year as we think fall is coming, and people get out their uh, leggings and their, their boots and their sweaters, and then they go out and they sweat like pigs because it's 70 degrees in the morning and 85 in the afternoon. So what we're going to do as a compromise is we'll make sure it's 60 degrees in here each and every Sunday. So you'll have that look for That'd be good, right? No? It'd be very cold. Uh, so Converge will resume next Sunday. Uh, most everything will start again next Sunday except men and men, men to men and women to women do start tomorrow night. Because it has been two weeks, uh, so back tomorrow night. And if that changes, Pastor Mark will put something out because he is taking care of our men to men. So that's tomorrow night. Awana is delayed until the 20... Oh, oh man, I, I was thinking, yeah. So this Wednesday, Awana starts. See, it's September 20th. Oh, my goodness. There's how many days till Christmas, Zane? You just had it on the Facebook. 95 days or so, Zane's been listening to Christmas music for about 300 days now. The men's prayer breakfast, will be, that'll be back in August, uh, October, uh, so pay attention to the current for that. Uh, we're still available. Pastor Zane is on uh, call this week if you need him. Uh, I'm available this week as well because <coughs> I'm, I'm all better. <coughs> no, really, I am. I'm, I'm fine. <coughs> uh, the facilities all be nice and clean. Everything being, everything will be good to go. So men to men, women to women tomorrow night. Converge back next Sunday. Bible study back next Sunday. Awana this Wednesday. So be ready for that. So I hope everybody has a great week. Uh, uh, this is the first day of the week, right? Catch your phone. I'll give it to you later. All right, let's pray. Father, we are grateful. Lord, thankful that we have the technology that we can uh, we can be beamed into people's homes that people can still feel that they're a part of the congregation even though we may not be able to worship together corporately. So Father, I pray that you would take this time to knit people's hearts together. Lord, give us an excitement uh, and an eagerness to get back to worship together in the house of the Lord. Lord, bless us this week as we seek to follow you. And I pray as always that we would be doers of God's word and not